All right, so hello everyone. Welcome to a webinar with uh, FX Street and SecondSketchForex.com. My name is Chris Capri, and this class is on Ichimoku trading. And we're going to be talking about several things today. I want to focus on some interesting patterns that are happening in the market with dollar yen, something we haven't looked at in a while. We're going to be checking out dollar Swiss. And talking about what are some of the signs of a possible reversal in dollar Swiss. And then we're also going to be looking at euro sterling. And we're going to look at pound yen. Pound yen's coming up against a critical level. And something that we're going to watch out for. And then beyond that, we will be taking questions on pairs and things that you're looking at after we cover all that. So if you have things in mind, that you want to cover, things you want to look at, trades you're in, things you want to use for each Ichimoku analysis, we'll be happy to look at those after we cover these. Now before we begin, just want to let you know today's webinar is being recorded, so we all have to be civilized, and uh, what that also means is that we want to keep the material very focused on the subject of Ichimoku. So you may have questions that are outside of the subject of Ichimoku. If you have them, then I would suggest table them and we can deal with them in another class. But for right now, we want to keep this class solely focused on Ichimoku and all its components within. Now, before I begin, is there anybody here that is new, that this is your first time, uh, you've never been to a class before, uh, I want to, never done any Ichimoku, is there anybody here that this is your first time? If so, first of all, I want to welcome you on board, and secondly, I want you to feel very comfortable here, that if at any point in time you have a question, I want you to just type it into the chat. Let me know what the question is, and I'll be happy to answer as soon as uh, as soon as I have an available moment. In fact, I can usually take things on the fly really well. So, is there anybody here that this is your first time coming to this class? Uh, anyone at all? I recognize a lot of the names here, but we may have some new people. And if we don't, then that's very good then. Dane says me. Fantastic. Welcome, Dane. Good to have you here. Anyone else here that this is your first time to a class on Ichimoku? Jorge says yes. Great. Welcome, Jorge. Indie Trader as well. Fantastic. Good. And KT33. All right. Great. Fantastic. Well, welcome to you all there for this for class. Um, for those of you who don't know, or for those of you still getting familiar with it, Mauricio Alvarez as well. Fantastic. This, oh, we got actually a few more. Joseph John, first timer, and Perican Trade. Okay, great. So we got actually a fair amount of people here that are relatively new. So welcome them. Okay, well then, real briefly, I need to break out. Wolf was kicked out. <laughs> I need to explain um, some of the basics of this thing here because there are several components of this, and we'll be talking about them. We'll be using these names, and so I want you to get familiar with these. For those of you that are new, we're going to take a few minutes to describe those here, and then we're going to start to get into this indicator and talk about uh, how we're going to apply it to trading. Okay, so first of all, this method was created, actually the original synthesis of it was in the 1930s, but the final publication came in the 1960s by a Japanese person named Kohichi Osada. And what happened was is he was looking for an indicator that could do a couple things all in one. He was kind of looking for a master indicator. The first thing he was looking for was an indicator that could pick up trends. And what that is is, Something that would kind of detect when a trend is happening, when we're still in a trend, when a trend is going to end. And to the Japanese, those were the moves that they wanted to be in. They didn't want to be in non-trending environments. They felt all the money was in the trends because the money was already moving heavily in one direction. So it was more easier, it was much easier to make money when the market's in a trend than it's when not within the trend. The other thing that they wanted to do is find future support and resistance. Not just where current support and resistance is, but where the support and resistance will be in the future and how that can actually have an impact upon price for us. This was the other thing that was uh, the intention behind this, this method was being created. This is what they were looking for, was future support and resistance. And also reversals. When is the market reversing from a trend? And so all of this was the intention of what the author tried to create, he was looking at this indicator and building this, and he was very successful at doing that. And with that, 
became the Ichimoku Cloud. He had teams and teams of statisticians and researchers, and they didn't have computers really to system, so they were doing all the calculations by hand. It took a huge team of people, and after doing all this, this is what was created. And it's been incredibly popular, and it's getting more and more popular every single year. In fact, the chief technical analyst for Barclays is uses this model, or a model of Ichimoku, quite often in detecting where the market is moving. So it's becoming very, very popular on a high institutional level, and people all over the world are starting to get to notice it. It was kept kind of quiet for a long time until 2005, 2006. I taught the first class in the West on it to a public audience in 2007, and that's the class that you're seeing now that's been going on for over three years. And so that is the basic history of this. Now, all those components of what it was trying to do, it does that through a series of components within the indicator. And let's talk about them. The first line that I'm going to be referencing is this white line here. This is the Tenkin line. So this line right here. The Tenkin line is very simply, we take the last nine candles of whatever time we're on, we take the highest high, the lowest low, and over the last nine periods, the absolute high and low over that, and we track price over that. Divide it by two and then shift it over nine periods. And so it's kind of like a nine period price action line. It's not like a nine moving average. Moving averages are smooth. As you can see, there's nothing that's smoothed out on this. That makes it a little more sensitive to price. So when price makes an adjustment, the tanking line often does it as well. The main focus of what the tanking line does is twofold. First, it tracks momentum. It's often known as the momentum line, the datum line, the turning line. And so it's really trying to track momentum on a particular instrument. The second thing it does, as a typical turning line does, is that it's also trying to tell you when a turn or swing or trend is about to happen in a particular instrument. And so that's the other focus it does that. It does that by crossing with this line here, this red line called the Keijin line. The Kijun line is known as trend line or Kijun Sen. And the main goal of the Kijun is to tell you what side or where the trend is at and if we're still in a trend and to contain the trend. Once it fails to contain the trend, then it, or once the market fails to stay on one side of it, then generally that trend is over. And this is a very loose definition, just to give you the basic idea behind it. So the Tenkin and the Kijun are really tracking the momentum and the trend, and they can perform what are called crossovers, or Tenkin-Kijun crossovers. When they do that, they can create generic bearish or bullish signals. The downward crossover is a generic bearish signal. An upward crossover like this one is a generic bullish signal. But the great thing that Gohichi Asada did was that he was able to define the strength and likelihood of that crossover leading to a move based upon where this crossover is in relationship to the cloud. Is it below it? Is it inside of it? Is it above it? And that will increase the strength or weakness of that. Now, the thing in terms of determining future support and resistance is what this thing does, this blue thing, the Kumo. That's what it's designed to do. It's designed to give you support and resistance levels. And as you can see, it's changing in shape changing in shape, changing in thickness and thinness, trajectory. And that's because the market evolved. This is a very non-Western approach to the support and resistance. If you think of all the Western methods out there that have created support and resistance, let's take a look at them. Channels, trend lines, Fibonacci, pivot point. They all look at it as a very straight line. That line could be angled, but it's still a line. So they tend to look at it from more of a mathematical perspective, a pure mathematical or pure uh, linear perspective. Posada didn't believe support and resistance was purely linear. He believed that support and resistance was something that was evolving, and it was directly related to how the previous price action was behaving. He was very concerned with how price action moved, and that the price action should determine future support and resistance levels. Where price was and has been and how it's behaved should determine where the market will likely have problems with future support and resistance. 
And that's why this Kumo takes on different shapes and sizes and trajectories. Now, the Kumo has two small components. And then once I'm done describing the Kumo, you guys will have the basic language, and then we're going to start going how we apply it. We're going to start off with the dollar yen. The Kumo has two basic components to it. It has this white line here, which is called Senku Span A. We'll just call it Span A. Span A is the simple halfway point between the Tenkin and the Kiju. We take it in half, shoot it 26 time periods ahead, and that is your Senku Span A. Senku Span B, which is this blue part of the Kumo, is the last 52 candles. We take the high and the low, we divide that by two, and we shoot that 26 time periods ahead. Now that's kind of important because what it's doing is it's constantly monitoring the range for the last 52 candles. Whether it's a four hour chart or a daily chart or whatever, it takes the last 52 candles and it says, look, these have a certain significance to price action. And so with that being said, we want to find out what the high and low is because that should tell us where future support and resistance is likely to be. And what it does, it takes that high and low, it cuts it right down the middle, and it projects that 26 time periods ahead. So my guess is, is that the high and the low of the last 52 candles probably reside somewhere between here and here. Somewhere between here and here. Depends. It could be here to here. You know, this is the, this is the high and this is the low. Somewhere around here. Now, the shading in between is merely just the space between the two values, and that becomes the Kumo. The Kumo itself is designed to represent support and resistance. And what that means is, is that this, if it's really thick, we are inside support and resistance right now. Currently, the dollar yen is inside, on a four hour chart, is inside support and resistance. Generally, that's not the range that you want to be trading. Typical Ichimoku models will say, look, you don't want to trade inside the Kumo. You want to wait till you've either cleared support below it or you've cleared resistance above it. Inside there is, is a, a zone we don't want to trade in, and understandably so. Now, why is this formation interesting? Why am I looking at dollar yen? I'm looking at dollar yen for a very specific reason. For those of you that have been trading the Ichimoku Cloud or come in this class for a while, what do you think that reason is? Any guesses? as to why I'm very interested in the dollar yen. Anyone have any ideas for those that have been taking this class for quite a while? Yes, yes no, any idea? Flat top. PED said it perfectly. Flat top. Japanese traders use it. Nice. <laughs> KT33 is first class and he's uh he's already he's already cracked it. That's good. Clever. Can the price break through the Kumo? Absolutely price can break through the Kumo. It does it all the time. But the reason why I am monitoring this one here is because of this flat top. Now, why is a flat top significant? A flat top is significant for Ichimoku traders because of the following reason. Remember what Senku Span B is composed of. Senku Span B is the halfway point for the last 52 candles. In other words, the halfway point of the range. In a range, let's just say the range is from here to here, halfway point's probably somewhere around here. Close. Somewhere around there. Give or take. Now, in a range, if price is in a range for a long period of time, if price is spending a lot more time in the upper half of that range, it's generally got more bullish pressure then it does bearish pressure. However, if price is in the lower half of that range, it generally has more bearish pressure than it does bullish pressure. And so to Hosada, the main thing was, if price is on this half of it, then it's more likely to push to the upside. If it's on this half of the range, it's more likely to push to the downside. That was the intention behind the Senku Span B, was to constantly track that. The thing about it is, is, is that this halfway point here, these flat tops happen when the market gets stuck in a range and the high and low value doesn't change as the candles progress on. 
flat tops become significant because they represent the middle of a range. A middle of a range is also known as equilibrium. It's that halfway point where it's not in an oversold, it's not in an overbought, and the buyers and sellers are comfortable with the euro being on that price. So it becomes kind of like a magnet because it has a certain equilibrium for that particular price. What's interesting to note is that from this last high to the low, this flat top resides perfectly with the 50% Fibonacci. Now, instead of the market going to this 50% Fibonacci, selling off and coming back down just sub 86.50, it, it didn't do that. It sold off very aggressively, and then it just kind of stopped. It just stopped here, got some good buying pressure on it, tried to sell off again, and then it just sat right here for eight hours. Since then, over the last 12 hours, it's launched up, stopped here at the 38.2, and then opened and has now touched the 50% Fibonacci. Flat top Kumos become very, very significant because if they become broken, they often can signify a reversal and also a nice little entry point to get in it because especially since the Fibonacci is matching up with it, if we break this Fibonacci in the flat top, then the market can use it as a future support level role reversal to attack the upside. So flat tops are very, very useful. They're very, very powerful. They're more powerful on higher time frames such as the four hour dailies and weekly charts. Now let's see, we've got a couple comments here. Ian has something here. Kiwi Yen Daily has a nice flat top can and price has just broken through it today. Can we take a look after dollar yen? We can take a look at that after I punch through the others. But yes, we can definitely get to that. And thanks for bringing that up, Ian. We'll definitely take a look at Kiwi Yen. So absolutely. In fact, yen for once in a long time, yen is going to be more of the highlight today. We have dollar yen, we have pound yen, and now we have Kiwi Yen to look at. So thanks for mentioning that, Ian. We'll definitely take a look at that for sure. Okay, so this is why I'm watching this here, because this is a unique formation. So I'm going to watch for price here, see if I can get a four-hour close above it. And if I get that, then I'll look for price to settle onto this flat top here, treat it as support instead of resistance. Once it does that, then I'll look for the pair to re-attack this 61.8 and possibly break beyond that. If it can get past the 61.8, my suspicions are it's returning back to 89 to challenge this little double top here. Now, one little tricky thing that we're going to have to watch out for is this. We go to the daily chart. We're going to have to watch out for something that I deleted earlier. Give me just a moment. Twenty MA is coming by. Ironically, the last sell-off that we were measuring the fifty percent Fibonacci off of was the last rejection off the 20 MA. So we're sitting at this 50% right here. In between the 50 and the 61 eight is this 20 EMA. So far, the 20 EMA has rejected price a lot. Boom, boom, double touch here, boom. I have a feeling that this time when it approaches the 20 EMA, we're either gonna see a very, very aggressive sell-off and the pair tries to make new lows, but what I think is the more likely scenario of the two is that it's going to test it, maybe get a small rejection, I think it's going to break it. That is my suspicion, both based upon the price action and the Ichimoku analysis. When I put those two together, I think it's going to take out the 20 MA. And I think if it does that, and the 61.8, then you set up a nice move for 89, and the Kijun, the falling Kijun, which has been hesitant as of lately, will probably be its first major test beyond 88. You have about 100 pips of breathing room before you run into a major test. Plenty of profit inside there to do that. So this is what I'm watching for on the dollar yen. I think we're coming into some very significant territory for it, and we're likely going to see a good response from the market in the near future. Okay, and likely this week. Okay, I want to check out the dollar swift real quick. So we'll move to the euro sterling, dollar yen, or pound yen, and then kiwi yen, which Ian requested here. Okay, so let's take a look at dollar swiss we're going to start off on the daily chart now for those of you who haven't been tracking dollar swiss 
Dollar Swift has been in a massive free fall from 117. Sold off incredibly aggressively. In fact, from June 8th to July 15th, five weeks, the pair dropped from 117 to 104. 1300 pips. That's one of the fastest one month declines in the history of this pair. Quite aggressive. But it's really been kind of stuttering and stalling as of late. In fact, it did a nice little double bottom right off the 104 and has since then been getting really aggressive and is now really pressing upon that 20 EMA, which to me is very, very interesting. So this thing's been in a free fall, and now it's showing some signs on the daily chart of a bottom is in place and that this pair might want to make a big move to the upside. When we look upon the four hour time frame, we can see that that stalling at the bottom that we're seeing on the daily chart has a material aspect on the four hour chart as well. Let me zoom out just a little bit to show you a little bit further. So, so since sell off from 117, the pair broke below the Kumo just at 116. It hasn't been above the Kumo since then. Tested it a couple times to the T and then sold off for another run. However, the pair has now broken through the Kumo and ironically it's done it at the weakest point in the Kumo that we've seen so far. This is the weakest formation of the Kumo since this entire downtrend started. Once this downtrend started, this Kumo just got thicker and thicker and thicker and kept going strong. Then the Kumo flattened out, and it got thin in the same shot, and now the pair has broken above it. This could, from an Ichimoku perspective, this has all the signs of a reversal taking off now. Double bottom, breaking through a Kumo, making a higher low, and then pushing up higher to get past the Kumo. So we're seeing the same material aspect in the Ichimoku for reversal on the 4-hour chart, as we were seeing on the daily chart there. To me, how to trade this, we wait for one more little trip back down to the 105.50, 105.45 range, right where this flat top is. Ideally, it would happen inside 24 to 36 hours. It treats this as support over here, and then we use that to buy the pair up so that it goes higher and makes a run. Now remember, back on the daily chart, if we get above the 20 MA, the next in line is the Kijun. The Kijun is flat, saying the trend right now is flat, and the Tenkin is starting to curl up. So we're getting signs both from the the Tenkin and the Kijun on the Ichimoku on the daily charts. This thing is starting to turn. The Kijun doesn't come until 107.65. The day, the 20 MA is at 106.19, current price to the T. If we can get a four-hour close above that 20 MA, my suspicions are that this thing will make its way back up to 107.65, the Kijun there. Pretty, un relatively unchallenged. It might run into some interesting stuff at 107 here, these little spikes here, but that's the only real challenge I see on the way to 107.65, which is about 155 pips from now. So that is uh, what I'm looking at on the dollar switch. Now, a couple of comments here. We got one from Jack and we got one from Hurricane Trade. Jack says, Range move price often goes to the top or bottom of range, so midline Kumo may not cap price. Can we say Kumo is not good resistance support in range theory? If you've been in a, in a suspended range for a while, I would not consider the Kumo as a good support and resistance in a, in a prolonged range. However, when we've come from a trending environment and then we shift to something like this where it's taking a moment to bottom or top, you know, in this case bottom out and then turn up, then I would consider the Kumo to be a good support of resistance gauge because the market has been in a trend for a long time and it's just trying, I mean, for not just a long time, a big move, sometimes the market doesn't turn on a dime. And so that Ichimoku cloud, that Kumo right there, is basically saying, look, we're thinning out because the market is trying to attempt to make a reversal, but we still have been on one side of the Kumo for a long time. Oh, now we're on the other side. That's pretty significant. So in prolonged ranges, Jack, yes. What would be a good example of that? Euro-Yen 
on, say, a four-hour time frame. We've been stuck in the euro yen in this very tight environment for quite a bit, you know, 107 to 113. So in this case, I wouldn't exactly consider it the best thing to be using to gauge support and resistance. However, after a prolonged trend, absolutely I would. So hopefully that gives you some idea of how I'd use it there. All right, Parrot can trade as a question. Do you use the Chiku span? It's not shown the cam. Does it mean not helpful? This is a question I get all the time. Um, so the Chiku span is very simply a line which represents the price action, but it's just pushed 26 time periods back. Now, I've been doing this for a long time, and so especially Ichimoku. In fact, when I used to work for the broker, I taught an Ichimoku class, and I used to actually get laughed at because people were, you know, it was so new back then that people thought it was kind of ridiculous. They thought it was just too much, and it had all these crazy things. Nobody really took it seriously back then in 2004, except me. And I actually took one of the programmers from the broker and had him do some programming and coding on it to demonstrate how effective it was. And... So with that being said, um, I've been doing Ichimoku for a long time, and I've been doing trading for a long time. And I, to me, the Chiku span is is what I would call the extra fat, so to say. It's unnecessary. Why do I need a line up there, which represents the previous price action to the T, push 26 time periods back to give me an idea of where future support and resistance is? To me, I don't need it. So because I don't need it, to me, it's it's just an extra line. I don't need it. I can see all that information visually as it is. And so since I don't need it, I take it off. Now, does that mean you should not need it? That depends on you. You may need it. It may be useful to you. If it is, then I, I suggest using it. But if you find out that you don't need it, then don't do it. Do what suits your preference on this one here. If you find that it's useful and you find that it gives you information and that you're not able to see that information visually, then I would put it up. The importance is not whether it's up or not up. Having it up or not up doesn't make your Ichimoku trading more legitimate. Having it up or not up is really just a preference. You know, do you buy your suits with two buttons or three buttons? It's really just a preference. Do you like more solid color ties? Or do you like try, ties with stripes? It's really just your preference. One of them's not gonna, it doesn't mean you're more, a better trader or not. So my suggestion is, is find out what works best for you in terms of the Chiku span, and then decide to go with that. Use it or not use it. For me, I don't use it because I don't find it useful. But that's just me. So hopefully answers your question, Perrican Trade. Okay. Abel says, is it strange that as price was trending higher, the Kumo was actually thin? Is there any significance to the thin Kumo? I'm not sure which instrument. Are you talking about the dollar Swiss where price was tra trending higher? Earlier chart. Talking about Euro Yen? You're talking about Euro Yen? Or are we talking dollar Swiss? Four hour or daily chart? Because we have the four hour now. Are you talking about the daily chart? Or the four hour chart. Daily. Okay. Let's take a look at that so I can understand your comments. And then we're going to move on to Euro Sterling and Pound Yen and then to Ian's Kiwi Yen. As it was trending higher, you're saying it's strange that as price was trending higher, the Kumo was actually thin. The Kumo was thin uh, from this portion and this portion. It was getting thicker, but the reason why it was thin is because. The price action was in a prolonged range for quite a while, for two months, two and a half months. So we're talking about 10 weeks. It's a pretty fair amount of time for price action to be a range. And then all of a sudden, it went on a very powerful run, a very, very powerful run, to the point where this pair couldn't string more than two red candles in a row, and we only have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So from... The 15th of April to the 25th of May, 
weeks, which will come out five and a half weeks. Over five and a half weeks, the pair went from 108 to 117, roughly 900 pips. It's a very aggressive run for this pair. Actually, it went from here, 105 to 117, 1,200 pips in that time period. It's a very aggressive run inside five weeks. And so the reason why you got the same Kuma was because the pair was in such a sideways range for such a long time, and then the pair just took off running. And so it didn't give the Kumo time to catch up. And then the Kumo started to finally catch up, but by that time, this thing was already turning around. The Kumo did a very good job in telling us, hey, likely reversal is more likely here than if it happens later on in time. So is there any significance to the thing Kumo? Depends on how the Kumo is formed. Generally, the way you want to look at a thing Kumo is that a thing Kumo represents very little support and resistance. Remember, the, anytime you look at the Kumo, we always want to look at it as support and resistance. Therefore, if it's thin, the best way you can look at it as, hey, you know what, this is offering very little support and resistance in this case. So that's my thoughts on that, Abel. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, now I want to talk about Euro Sterling. What am I seeing going on in that? And then we're going to take a look at Pound Yen because it's about to do something unique or could do something unique, and we want to be aware of that. Euro Sterling is potentially doing something that it hasn't done in, in quite a long time, since March of this year. It's attempting to break above the Kumo here. Its first attempts went to the top of the Kumo, the other side of the coup, the span B, and then sold off since then. What that means is, is that this thing could start another leg to the downside, back to 81, and if it does that, we want to watch for a downward tanking Kijin cross, where the white line crosses downward over the Kijin there. That would signal another possible trend happening and another bearish signal. We want to be aware of that one there. Because minimally, it should go back to the 8100 if it does that. The alternative scenario is also what's happening here in the future. we got this flat top coming up here. We're going to have to be aware of it. And it's got a little second step there. So we're going to want to be aware of this because if it decides to break above this, it might use this as support to try and make another move higher, first stopping at 8,500 and then going all the way up to you know just about 8,800 after that. So keep in mind here, this one's got two interesting scenarios. It's kind of sitting at a crux right now, a fulcrum, and it's teetering on both sides right now, and it hasn't really shown its cards yet. If it continues to push below the Kijun, then the probabilities increase that it will create a downward tank of Kijun cross and re-attack 81. However, if it uses the Kijun as support and continues to use it as support, then chances are this thing will push to the upside above this flat top Kumo and try to run to the upside. Both the Tenkin and the Kijun are flat, suggesting no momentum and no trend. And so that means right now we wouldn't want to be trading on Euro Sterling yet. We don't want to make a plan yet. There's no evidence on our side that we want to be involved in. So keep an eye on Euro Sterling on this one here, because we have these two interesting scenarios coming up. Now, one interesting scenario that I really like from an Ichimoku perspective is this flat top right here. This flat top has some significance because of these previous rejections here at 136.22, the double here on the daily, this one here, and then here it's attempt, but also because of that 50% Fibonacci that's parked right there. The market has been trying to break this. It's been incredibly choppy trading this pair lately. Stuck between 131 and 136, and it's spent half the time above it and half the time below. It's just been an absolute mess. Tight range here, 260 pips here, 260 pips here. Mix of red candles and blue candles. Mix of red candles and blue candles. It breaks up, it goes down. It's just been an absolute mess. And I think that this pair is trying to break out of this cage. I think it's trying to break out of this cage, especially since the most recent price action, as we can see here, has been the most aggressive three-day move that we've seen in a while. It bounced right off a of previous support here. There's a lot of rejections here. In fact, the lowest close that this pair has had was 131.96. And it's had a rejection all the way down to 130.44. That means 150 pip area has been a pure rejection zone for quite some time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
eight times the pair has tried to close below 132 and it's failed. So the market has been relatively comfortable buying below 132, giving it about 150 pips leeway, knowing that a rejection will probably play itself out, and it'll push this pair back up to 134. Each time it's rejected off this level, it's made it back up to 134. So this time, though, it's a little bit different. After a very aggressive sell-off, we had a nice rejection. We followed up with a very large blue candle, a little bit of sawing, and then another aggressive candle attacking this 136.34 flat top Fibonacci. To me, it seems like it wants to push out of this. It has it that it has the the behavior of something that wants to push out. The one note of caution that we have to be cautious about here, we have to be, take notice of, is that we are in the high point of summer trading, which is the low point in terms of liquidity and volume. Liquidity and volume is way down across the board. And so what that means is, is that you don't want to trade pure breakouts. You want to trade a breakout pullback. Because if there isn't enough liquidity, then there's not going to be enough force and verve and buying power behind a breakout. And so what that means is that the pair will probably pull back to some sort of level before it really takes off. So to me, the way I'm going to watch this is I'm going to wait for a daily close above it, and I'm going to look for the pair to use this as support, maybe on a four-hour time frame, find support at 106.34, and if it treats it as support, and it doesn't get impulsive to the downside but stays corrective, then I'll look for this pair to launch up from 136.34 to 138.60. That's 130 pips away. Technically 126. Sorry, 226. So there's a lot of potential profit on that one there. The other thing is that we could also be getting in this above the daily Kumo for the first time since May, and that could produce pretty solid moves. The last time it got above it, it was able to go from 141 all the way up to 145, a good 450 pip move. So there's a lot of potential profit and a possible reversal coming here. Also to note is that this pair has sold off made new lows. Sensen has pulled back into these range and re-eclipsed these previous highs here. So it's not behaving like something that wants to continue a downtrend. It's behaving like something that wants to reverse. And so that's why I'm really watching the sterling in on this one here. Ken says, can you repeat the liquidity effect of the market on the summer? Sure, I can do it very simply. So... If you think about it, summer is a time where everybody wants to go on vacation. Johnny's out of school. Take Johnny on vacation. You know, you go to different places around the world. Uh, summertime is when I usually like to go on vacation, of course. Um, but I live in South America right now, so it's summertime here pretty much most of the year. So with that being said, since a lot of traders are going on vacation, a lot of them pull out. Hedge funds, institutional banks. They pull out a lot of the market liquidity. They pull out a lot of the orders. And as they pull out a lot of the orders, there's less involvement in the market. You don't have your, all your A trading crews on at the bank. Sometimes you have the B and C trading crews up. And so since there's less liquidity in the market, <laughs> um, since there's less liquidity in the market, what that means is, is that there isn't necessarily as much volume or verve behind a move. And so if something's wanting to break out, Let's say it's used to having, you know, a billion pounds on any given four hours. Let's say over four hours, a billion pounds of liquidity goes through sterling. Well, if we're in the summer and the liquidity is less and it has, say, half a billion pounds, it's not going to have as much force behind it to push and create an official breakout to where it just breaks out and goes. In fact, we're seeing the same thing happen right now on euro dollar. Euro dollar on a four hour time frame, if we take a look at it, you know, the pair was sitting right at one thirty, it then broke above it to thirty fifty, and then since sold off again since then. If it had a lot more liquidity, it would be a lot easier for this to push through. Kind of like in American football, if you have a lot of people on your side there, then we have a lot more force behind it. It's much easier to break through a line. But if you don't have that force, it's much harder. 
So hopefully answers that question. Does that answer your question there, Ken, about market liquidity and having its effects on summer? Traditionally, summers have less liquidity, which means that the market has less of a chance to produce huge moves, much more hesitant, and so breakouts aren't to be trusted as much. Does that answer your question there, Ken? Yes, no? Hopefully. All right, well, what? Yes, just the pullback effect when breakouts happen. Exactly. Okay. And yes, Ian, I haven't forgot about your Kiwi Yen and your daily flat Takuma. Haven't forgot it all, and we're going right to it. And thank you for reminding me. Okay, so let's take a look at that. So, with that being said, um, we got a flat top breakout happening right now as we speak on the Kiwi Yen. And let's take a look at this. We've already talked about how Dollar Yen is kind of showing some signs of a possible move to the upside on Dollar Yen. We're seeing some of the same signs in the Sterling Yen. And now we're seeing the same sign on the Kiwi Yen. So it all fits into this big puzzle, particularly about the Yen right now. The pair has sold off, and let's see if it pulled back to a Fib level. Had the 69 to 59 move, and went right to the 61.8 and then sold off. Instead of going right back to the zero point, which is the beginning of this, or the end of this trend here, the pair made a higher low. In fact, it actually went to the 50, made a higher low, went to 61.8, made a higher low here, actually parallel low, but had a lot of rejection. Instead of having closes sub-60, it got rejections off the 60 level. And that, to me, suggests that the market said, okay, look, this pair has tried boom, 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 three, four attempts here. It just hasn't been able to do it. Then the market was bought up again, went right back to the 50, and then produced a higher low. So this is behaving like a pair from a price action perspective as something that wants to push to the upside. We have now broken, after four days of straight climbs, we have now broken this flat top for the first time and broken above the Kumo for the first time since May 4th was the last time we were had an actual close above the, uh, the Kumo here. To me, this is a legitimate Kumo break, and the Kumo comes perfectly at the 50%. So to me, what I would be looking for, it also comes at a round number, in some sense, it's kind of ideal. What I would be looking for is for price action to close above this high right here at 64.28. If we can get that close above 64.28, then my suspicion is that the price will probably pull back maybe in Tokyo, maybe in early London. If it treats 64 and starts to stall here, use it as support, then my thoughts are this thing will probably hold here and make an attack on the 61.8, which is at 65 and a quarter, 125 pips up. To me, this is a good Kumo break. I like this one. So I will be watching this one as well. Absolutely. I think the pound yen is a little more interesting in some sense because the space between the Kiwi yen's 50% and 61.8 is only 125 pips. But with the sterling yen, it doesn't have any previous nearby highs. You know, here it was already at the 618 and also has this. It hasn't been above its 50% in quite a long time. So it doesn't have an immediate resistance in the near future hanging around here. It's had a much lo longer time below the 50% Fibonacci. To me, if it breaks it above that 50% Fibonacci and Kumo, to me it's a little bit more significant. It's also got 250 pips of upside instead of 100 and a quarter. So it's got better R to R ratios on that one then. But overall, I like this one. If I had to choose between this one and Sterling Yen, I would choose the Sterling Yen over that. But I like this one as well. So good spot on that. Good eye on that one there. All right. And then Kanahi has a question here. Let's go to that one. Every indicator strategy tend to work perfectly well in longer time frames. Does it work on a one hour time frame? Well, first of all, if you found that to be true, can I, then why aren't you trading on the larger time frame? <laughs> if you've already found out that indicators work really well on the higher time frames, like four hours and dailies, 
why would you want try and want to do something on a lower time frame? Just curious. It's kind of like if something already works, you have a method to make money. Why do we why do we need to reconfigure it? Break it down to a smaller time frame when we found something that makes money. That's my I guess that's my my first question. But since you want me to answer your question, does it work on a one-hour time frame? It does. It's just not going to be as refined and as accurate, especially in low-liquidity summer environments. Yeah, greed. Exactly, Dane. Greed. The funny thing is, if this thing my, – my guess is there's probably one of two reasons why you're – yeah, exactly. I think Jose – wow. Jose pretty much put on the mic. The reason why you're probably wanting to see if it works on a one-hour time frame is you want to make more money faster. What makes you think trading on a one-hour time frame is going to make you more money faster? I know it produces more trades, but if it's not as accurate, you're not making any money faster. You're just working harder. Remember, the whole point of trading is you're not paid by the number of trades that you make. You are paid by how much you make per trade. The real secret to trading is making the least amount of trades and the most amount of money. Your broker won't like that. Your IB probably won't like that. But the bottom line is is that your job as a trader is to make the most amount of money with the least amount of trades. The more trades you have to make, the more accurate you have to be because you have to be more accurate more times because you're making more trades. And the harder the more work you're doing because you're paying more spreads you have to also find more setup so with that being said if you found that something works on a four hour daily time frame why change it but to answer your question yes it does work on the one hour time frame it's just not as efficient it's not as accurate and you have to be much more skilled to do that and since you're still my guess is you're probably still learning this indicator tonight I would recommend still practicing it on the four hour and daily time frame. Just because you get more signals doesn't mean you're going to make more money faster. And if greed really is the reason why you're doing it, that's the wrong reason to be making trade, that's to be making trading decisions. Greed is never the reason to be making trading decisions. It, it, the reason why you want to make trading decisions is because there's good trade. Can I says you don't like the large stop loss? Well, can I, that shouldn't be a problem because you can change position sizing. In fact, you can change accounts. There's enough flexibility in accounts and position sizing to where stop loss shouldn't be a big deal. Large stop losses aren't that big a deal if you have a small position size. If you have a 50 pip stop and you're risking 2% or you have a 500 pip stop and you're risking 2%, how is that any different? There's no difference. One's, it's the same amount of risk to your account. So you should be able to – there's enough types of accounts now that you can have flexibility to adjust the position sizing so that it's the same amount of risk to your account. Size of the stop should never be a reason to trade or not trade. It should always be how much are you risking to your account. So hopefully that answers your question there. All right, Ian says something here. The Kiwi Yen is 20, 30 pips away from breaking through the weekly Kumo 2. Ooh, let's take a look at this. You are like the Kiwi Sniper for today. Okay. The difference between this one and the other one is that the other one has spent one side of the market. And so by breaking through to the upside, it's signaling a much more powerful, you know, type of trend reversal. But this pair has already been above it and used it a few times as support. And it's dipped into it. If it breaks back above it, it's kind of nothing new. So to me, the weekly isn't quite as powerful as the daily. I think the daily one is the more potent one to watch. But good spot on that one there. So hopefully that gives you some idea about that. Okay. Fantastic. So with that being said, um, I need to wrap it up now. We're coming to the end of this class here. First of all, I want to thank you all for coming. It was great having all of you here. And so that's pretty much it. Uh, something I haven't done in a while is go down the list of people and thank you all for coming. So going down the list, Boyke, Ped, Carl Blank, Helen, Shari, Eric and Trade, Jose, Greg, Dane, v, uh, VY, Jorge, Kanai, Tomcat, Viala, 
Carly, Andy, Trader, Jocelyn, MCKT33, Mauricio Alvarez, Rafa, Joseph, John, Nick, Duel, Wessel, Abel, SBC, M. Glenn, Wolf, Spencer R, Ash, Finn Pro, Ian, Ken, Jack, One, M, or May, Tom D, Mullet, Wen, Young, Vin, Trady, Dina from Australia, uh, perhaps the guy, but that's the guy I've been talking to on my email, and Jacobo11. Thank you all very much for coming. It was great having you here. If you have any questions about our services, check us out at secondskiesports.com. If you have any specific questions, email me, info at secondskies.com. I'll be happy to talk to you. I'm going to be on chat on my website for the next 15 minutes. So if you want to chat and talk to me personally, have some questions, I'd be happy to talk. Also a note, next web, next week, I am going on vacation. Uh, I got a ski and snowboard trip in the Patagonia Mountains here. So I will be on vacation next week. I'll be in the beautiful Bariloche, if anybody knows what that is. Probably one of the most gorgeous places in South America. So I will not be here next week, so no classes. So I'll see you two weeks from now. So until then, I bid you all adieu. Good luck trading, and I will be seeing you soon. Take care, everyone.